My name is Manuela Tan and I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Neurology at Oslo University Hospital. I will be teaching this module which has been developed together with Hirotaka Iwaki at the National Institutes of Health. The module today is focused on genome-wide association studies of Parkinson's disease progression. This will be the first module of five from our course syllabus. Here's a brief summary of my presentation. Firstly, I will give some background about genome-wide association studies, or GEOASs, of Parkinson's progression. I will then talk about some of the different statistical approaches that can be used to assess Parkinson's progression in your GEOAS. Next, I will talk about the clinical and genetic data that is needed for your analysis. Then we will move into the practical session and learn how to run your progression GEOAS in Terra with an example dataset. At the end, I will talk a bit about limitations and things to consider when you are running your progression GWAS. So, first starting with some background about GWASs of Parkinson's disease. I'm not going to cover this in a lot of depth in this course, because this has already been covered in the Parkinson's disease for non-geneticists course in Module 7, and also as part of the Beginner Bioinformatics for Parkinson's disease genetics course in Module 3. Both modules went over important concepts and background for understanding the genetics of progression and age at onset. And you also learned what a GEOAS is, as well as challenges and limitations. However, I will briefly recap on some key concepts for this course. Firstly, if you think about a traditional case control GEOAS, you compare Parkinson's disease patients and healthy th controls. This gives information about the genetic variants that are associated with disease risk. One example of this is the 2019 GWAS meta-analysis by Mike Knowles, which identified over 90 loci associated with Parkinson's risk. You have probably seen this study mentioned multiple times in previous modules. However, in the GWAS of progression, you analyze Parkinson's patients only, and you are looking for differences between patients this is because we know there is a lot of heterogeneity between patients in clinical progression. For example, some people will progress slowly, meaning that their symptoms stay stable over time, while other people will progress quickly, meaning their symptoms may change and get worse in a short period of time. Here, I have summarized the key differences between the types of GWAS. In a case control GWAS, you are comparing PD patients to healthy controls in order to look for variants associated with disease risk. This is usually done with a logistic regression as your outcome is binary, either case or control. In a progression GWAS, this is usually a GWAS where you are looking within Parkinson's patients only. This type of GWAS will give you information about genetic variants associated with a particular phenotype within patients for example, the rate of progression. These variants may be the same as the genetic factors influencing disease risk and onset. For example, we know that GBA variants are associated with increased risk for Parkinson's and also earlier onset and more rapid progression. However, the genetic factors for progression may also be different to the genetic factors influencing disease risk and onset. Usually, for these types of GWASs, we use linear regression or other statistical models for longitudinal outcomes. We do these GWASs to understand more about the genetics and biology of progression within Parkinson's patients. As I mentioned, these variants and mechanisms for disease progression may not be the same as those underlying disease risk, although there may be overlap. I recommend going through Module 7 from the Parkinson's Disease Genetics for Non-Geneticists course to learn more about this topic. Now I will cover the practical aspects of a progression GWAS. The first thing to consider is that there are many different approaches that you can use for your GWAS. Firstly, there are multiple ways to measure progression in Parkinson's. There are many different scales measuring a variety of symptoms, and Hirotaka Iwaki described these in more detail in Module 7 of the GP2 course that I mentioned earlier. For motor symptoms, the MDS-UPDRS Part 3 is the most widely used assessment and is also frequently used to assess progression in clinical trials. 
However, for other symptoms, such as cognition, there are several scales, including the MOCA, MMSE, scope of cog or other neuropsychiatric tests, and these may measure different aspects of cognition. Another thing to consider if you are analysing multiple cohorts is that different cohorts may use different scales, which can be challenging for harmonising data across cohorts. You can also measure progression to particular endpoints, such as clinical milestones. Some common ones are progression to dementia, cognitive impairment, honin yar stage 3 or greater, or mortality. Some of these, like mortality, are very easy to define, but others, like dementia or cognitive impairment, can be defined in many different ways. Some studies also use a cutoff point in a continuous scale to create a binary endpoint. Thirdly, you can also look at raw scores on a scale or change from baseline. Alternatively, you can try to make composite progression scores by combining data from lots of different scales. In addition to these multiple methodologies of measuring progression, there are also different ways to analyse progression. You can use linear mixed models for continuous outcomes like the MDS-UPDRS. You can also use Cox proportional hazard models to look at progression to a binary outcome, for example, mortality. I will talk about these two models in more detail later. However, you could also analyse progression using standard linear regression. For example, if you only have two time points and you calculate a single change score between them. Or you could define fast and slow progressors as a binary outcome and compare these with logistic regression. Overall, it is important to keep in mind that there are many different ways of looking at progression and you need to think about what data you have and how you want to run your GOAS. I'm going to start with linear mixed models, also called linear mixed effects models. This is an extension of a simple linear regression. It is a method used to assess longitudinal continuous outcomes, such as the MDS-UPDRS or MOCA. So if we start off with a single measurement of the MDS-UPDRS, for example, this is what we might analyse in a traditional linear regression, if you only have one time point. However, in a longitudinal study, you probably repeat this assessment a few times, so you ask your patients to come for several follow-up visits. Now we have multiple observations of the MDS-UPDRS at different time points. For example, time one might be after one year, and time two might be after two years. The x-axis here represents time. The y-axis represents a scale you were looking at. Here it is the MDS-UPDRS part 3. You can then extrapolate the slope or rate of progression over time for each of your patients. This is what we analyse in a linear mixed model. The average slope from many patients and also the intercept or time zero, which is the baseline measurement. We use these models when there is non-independence in the data, also called hierarchical structure or clustering. We use this for longitudinal data because we expect there is correlation between observations at different time points from the same individual. There are also other ways of grouping or clustering, so linear mixed models can be used for other types of data sets and analyses, but I won't go into these here. The important thing is that they are commonly used to analyse longitudinal or repeated measures data. We call these mixed effects models because they contain both fixed and random effects, and let me explain what that means. Fixed effects are the differences between individuals that we can measure and are interested in studying in our regression models. These are interpreted in the same way as in simple linear regression and can include genetics, gender, age, or drug effect in a clinical trial. These are the variables that we want to draw conclusions about. For example, we want to know whether SNP X affects progression. Random effects are the grouping factors that influence outcomes that we want to control for, but we are not necessarily interested in studying their impact on the outcome. For instance, in longitudinal data, you have multiple observations at different time points for one individual. 
when we analyze longitudinal data, we usually include the individual as a random effect. This is because the observations from one individual tend to be correlated due to lots of factors that you don't necessarily measure or know of. The individual is a grouping factor that we know influence the observations, but we aren't usually interested in drawing conclusions about the effect for one individual on progression. The concept of random effects compared to fixed effects can be tricky to understand, and what you choose to be your fixed or random effects can also depend on your research question. But I've included some additional links at the end of this talk, which might be helpful in explaining these concepts in a bit more detail. With a mixed effects model in a longitudinal study, you can account for variability of an effect, say SNP X, between individuals. Here, the SNP X is the fixed effect, and the individual is included as a random effect. In these diagrams, each dotted line represents an individual. There are multiple ways that you can include the random effect. In the left illustration, we can include a random effect term for the intercept only. By doing this, you can allow for variability between individuals around the intercept where the lines cross the y-axis. In our case, in a longitudinal study, this is the baseline measurement. You can see that the lines representing individuals vary around the mean intercept, which is a solid black line, but the slope is the same for all the lines. In this example, we would be saying that SNP X has the same effect on the rate of progression, so the slope is always the same, but individuals vary slightly in their baseline measurements. You can also allow for variability between individuals in the slope, which is the rate of progression. This is illustrated in the right diagram. Here, you can see that the individuals vary from the mean black line in both the intercept and the slope of the line. So in this model, we would be saying that SNP X affects the rate of progression, but this effect varies slightly between individuals. So individuals have slightly different rates of progression as well as baseline measurements. Let's now talk about Cox proportional hazards models, sometimes called survival analysis, because it is frequently used for analysis of mortality, but it can be used for any event. I recommend watching the GP2 research methods course for additional details. We generally use the Cox proportional hazards model for analyzing longitudinal binomial outcomes, where there are only two categories, that is, that each patient can be classified as meeting or not meeting the outcome. So for example, if you have longitudinal data on dementia, death, Honinyar stage three or greater, or depression, then you can analyze these data with the Cox model. One key assumption about the model is the proportional hazards assumption that states that the ratio of hazards for your groups is constant over time and does not change, i.e. that they are proportional. For example, in a genetic study, if we find that SNP X has an effect on progression, but the effect allele has a larger effect later in disease stage, say after 10 years, then the proportional hazards assumption may be violated and you would need to choose a more appropriate model. There are different ways of checking this assumption, which I will not cover in this course, but there are lots of resources on the line and I have included some links here which show you how to check this assumption. As you see here, Kaplan-Meier curves are commonly used as a visual representation for the survival model. These show the probability of surviving or not meeting the outcome up to a given time. A drop or step in the line means that one or more individuals has met the outcome of interest. A cross or vertical bar through the line, or sometimes a circle, means that an individual has been censored. Censoring is an important aspect of survival analysis. It means that information about an individual's survival time is incomplete. This can be due to several reasons. One reason could be that the individual does not experience the event before the study ends. Secondly, it could be because the individual has been lost to follow up during the study and they cannot be contacted. Thirdly, it could be because the individual has withdrawn from the study before it has ended, so there is no more data after they have withdrawn. 
The graph on the right has been taken from a well-known paper of Parkinson's progression by Sophie Winder Rhodes and team. This is not a GOAS, but a candidate variant analysis of GBA variants and how they influence progression. The graph shows three different groups based on GBA status, represented in the three colored lines. Here, you can see that the red line showing the patients carrying GBA mutations progress more rapidly to dementia than the other groups. I have linked this paper in the recommended readings if you want to have a look at it. Sometimes you may also be working with data that is not longitudinal, meaning there is no time component or you don't have repeated measures. For example, your data set may just have one measurement of cognition or dementia and no other data. In a way, this could still be used to assess disease progression up to that particular time point. Alternatively, you could have calculated a single change score from two time points or created a single composite score from multiple observations, as has been done in large GWAS studies of Parkinson's and also Huntington's disease, which I've linked in the recommended readings. In these cases where you have just one data point for each patient rather than longitudinal data, this can be analyzed in Plink or RV tests using simple linear or logistic regression, as has been shown in earlier GP2 courses, so I won't be demonstrating this today. However, I wanted to mention this so that you are aware that there are other ways of analyzing the data, even progression data. Now, what clinical and genetic data do I need? First of all, before you start, you may want to think about removing individuals who have been diagnosed with a different condition. These are patients who were recruited into your study as having Parkinson's, but then they have received a different diagnosis more recently, such as PSP, MSA, or more benign conditions like essential tremor. You would need to check whether these are still in your dataset, and if they are present, you may want to exclude them. If you include these cases in your Parkinson's progression GOS, it may bias results because conditions like PSP and MSA are usually more rapidly progressive than Parkinson's. Your progression GOS may then be picking up genetic signals for PSP risk or other disease risk rather than for Parkinson's progression. However, removing these patients may also limit the generalizability of your results because in a real life setting or clinic setting, you don't have information about which Parkinson's patients may go on to be diagnosed with a different condition. Also, it depends whether the study you are analysing has collected this data, as it may not always be available. You should also be aware of the specific inclusion and exclusion criteria for the studies you were looking at, as these may have implications for your results. For example, the PPMI patients were required not to be on Parkinson's medication at baseline, and not expected to need medication for the first six months. This may mean that they are slower progressing than other cohorts where there is no restriction on medication status at baseline. Other cohorts have other restrictions. For example, some studies exclude patients who have cognitive impairment at baseline. The AMPD cohorts include some patients specifically recruited because they carry known Parkinson's mutations, such as GBA and we know that GBA mutations cause more rapid progression. These are just some things to be aware of when you are looking at your data and your results. If you are analyzing data from multiple cohorts, it is also important to think about whether there are differences between your cohorts. To run your progression GOS, we will be using Bash, Plink, as well as Python or R. In our practical, we will actually use R within a Python notebook but you could use one or the other. You don't necessarily need to use both. You will also need your clinical progression data and the imputed genetic data. For this analysis, we will be using the hard call genetic data rather than the dosages. Finally, some cohorts may have a code break because their genetic data has different IDs to the clinical data. If this is the case for your cohort, you will need this code break to link the clinical and the genetic data together. To wrap up, we will talk about some limitations and things to consider when you are running your progression GOS. First, you need to think about what covariates to use in your model, as well as if the rate of progression is constant over time, 
I recommend watching the module that I highlighted at the beginning of this presentation. If the rate of progression changes over time, then it is important to think about what Z stage your participants are at at baseline and whether this is different between cohorts. Another thing to consider is collider bias. Because we have selected only Parkinson's patients based on the disease status for our analysis, this may induce biased associations. There may be factors that are actually independent, which show correlations in your data set because you have selected cases only, and this can influence the results of your progression analysis. This is a complex issue, which I won't go into more detail today, but I have linked some key papers in the recommended readings. To conclude this module, I have talked today about how to analyze longitudinal data for your progression GOS. Today, I have focused on two common approaches. Firstly, you can use mixed effects models for analyzing longitudinal continuous outcomes, such as repeated measures of the MDS UPDRS or MOCA. Secondly, you can use Cox proportional hazard models for longitudinal binomial outcomes, such as mortality or dementia. These are just some of the ways to analyze progression data in your GOS. Here, I have linked some of the helpful resources which cover some of the statistical concepts in more depth. I have also linked Hirotaka Iwaki's Parkinson's Progression Browser, which may be helpful if you want to meta-analyze your own progression GOS results with this publicly available summary statistics. Thank you for your attention today, and I hope you enjoyed the module.